Have you noticed how increasingly difficult it is to have any quality relationship with people in our day? Well, that's what we want to look about, look at tonight. We want to look at it as it relates to the world in which we live and how it spills right over into Christian relationships, which many times aren't relationships. Matthew chapter 24. Much of Matthew 24 definitely applies to the last days. When you look at the signs in Israel and you look at some of these general signs, sociological signs, we might could call them. <clears throat> there are others that are found here, but uh, sociological type signs in Matthew 24 and other passages. You certainly see these things all around us today. Paul gives a little list of these over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, there's no doubt about the fact that according to the prophets of the Old Testament, the Messianic era, which began with the first advent of Christ and will conclude with his second advent, all of that period of time makes up what the scriptures speak of as the last days or the latter days or the end times. He, he initiated a new era, a new dispensation with his advent. But, of course, as those years roll by, and 2,000 of them almost have come by since then, we know that we've got to be getting closer to the end. Now, you're going to hear this argument used all the time, and I'm, I want to say something about it because I just want to hammer this into your hearts uh, in the future as, as we mention things like this, that people will say, well, when you find Scripture like verse 7 here of Matthew chapter 7 that talks about the fightings and the wars that will take place and, and the other natural calamities, well, those have always happened in history. Now, I'm sure we've all heard that argument. Those have... Those things have always taken place in history. Well, that's probably true. No doubt that is true. These things have always taken place in history. But Jesus still said that certain things would characterize the last days. He still said that. Even though we might think that we have history to prove that this has always been true, he still said that certain signs would characterize the last days. And if there's if that has just always been the case, then passages such as Matthew chapter 24 lose their distinctiveness then. They lose their uh, uniqueness if this has just always been true. He still said this, even though they have taken place. There's something particular and something specific about what he says. Now, we could argue you know, for an increase in this. We could argue for it being more widespread. Uh, we could argue for it being worse than at any other times in history, and I think all of those arguments would certainly be true. But, of course, we still have people that would say, well, society and humanity, human civilization, has gone through its bumps and rolls and turns. At times it's good, at times it's bad. But there's one particular uh, verse we want to get to, which is, well, let me just start with 9. I want to get down to 12. Uh, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Now, that obviously must have some type of reference to Christians there. You'll be hated for me, for my name's sake. That time, many will turn away from the faith because, see, some of Matthew 24 probably does apply to the fall of the city of Jerusalem and the nation in A.D. 70, the hands of the Romans. But the Jews weren't hated of all nations because of Christ. They hated Christ. So they weren't identified with him so that they could be hated because of him. This has to apply to Christians. That time many of you will turn away or many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 12 is what we want, a very interesting verse. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because of the increase in wickedness, I think King James says iniquity, then the love of, of many would wax cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. He who stands firm against all of this wickedness and who stands firm in his love will be saved. Now, when it said that the love of most will grow cold, 
It's not really talking about people's love for God. Because notice the whole context here. You'll be betrayed by other people. You'll be hated by them. He said many will turn from the faith, will betray, and they hate each other in the last days. And so many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now that's what I want to major on tonight. Kind of a, well, an interesting study here. Just some thoughts that we actually are seeing around us right now as we've never seen before in history. All you have to do is be a part of the Western world. And the Western world is the significant part of the world today. It may not always be that way. It depends on how long the world lasts. Maybe power will shift to those third world countries or something. But right now, that's not true. Uh, The focus of everything is on the Western world. The Western world is what controls everything. Society, it just seems, has broken up. And so concentrate on America. You see, I know what the critics say, but I think that I've thought about this enough and studied it out enough that I'm really not afraid of what they say. Well, now, wait a minute. You can't just take some passage out of Matthew 24 and apply it so specifically to your generation in the United States of America because maybe the Bible's not talking about that. Well, the Bible's talking about something, though. We can't just say, well, people have always hated one another. Didn't Cain hate his brother way back then? Well, Jesus wasn't predicting Cain's time. That had already occurred thousands of years earlier. He still has to have his eye on something in the future when because of the abounding of iniquity and wickedness, the love of people would wane. It would wax cold. It would grow cold. And people would just cease having the ability. They're seared. They're cauterized because of the iniquity that just prevails around them and predominates in their world. They cease having the ability to love, to be kind, to have warm relationships, to even know what friendship is even about. What anymore today, people don't even know what it's about. Society is broken up. It's disintegrating around us. Mothers are always at work. We have seen, you see, some of us are still pretty young. And some of the things in the older days we have to talk about from someone else's recollection or from something that we've read. But most of the adults here, any adult here in the church, uh, no matter how young you are, you actually have lived through, let me, let me just get ahead of myself, if this country lasted for 200 years, the historians then would be writing about this generation, the 1950s, the 1960s, nothing, 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 nothing like the decade of the 1960s. Why, it's already in children's textbooks today. What you lived through that dark November in 1963 when President Kennedy was assassinated. Now, that, that was unique. That was the decade. It's been called the decade of the assassins. Everyone is trying to assassinate everyone then. Well, we had some earlier presidents that were assassinated, but nothing like this, though. Nothing like the revolt And there are so many, oh, there's just so much to say about this. What what I'm thinking of is what what Screwtape said to Wormwood, you know, it's it's all right if he studies sociology and anthropology, keep his mind off what they call the precise sciences, a mathematician, a physicist, uh, things like this. Well, you know, I, I see where he's coming from. I agree with that somewhat, that the precise sciences, there's something precise about them, and he gets you to think in a certain order. But living in the days in which we live, there is so much sociological input into what has changed American culture in the last few decades, which is what I guess calls it to be one of my most interesting topics to to discuss. With the the invention of the pill, we've never had any form of contraception that was as as, um, uh, available, as accurate, It's not 100%, but it comes close to it. And that just legalizes all forms of promiscuity then. The Vietnam War, Watergate right after that, right after that or during the same time, the legalization of abortion, assassination of presidents, uh, Senator Kennedy, the president's brother, uh, all the things that happened, uh, all of the racial turmoil, all the 60s, were certainly a decade. And see, I live down south, so I know about that. An incredible thing 
took place in this country. And all of these are various sociological inputs into this society that are changing the way we live, the way we think, the way we operate, that are certainly affecting people's relationship to one another. We're talking about colonizing space. When you talk about a lack of love and friendship, what are you going to do up there? Colonizing space, sending people all over the, the universe to live when God meant for us to live as a group of human beings here together. But what I was going to say is 200 years from now, if this country were around, and I doubt that it will be, they would be writing about things like the assassination of, of President Kennedy, um, putting the first man on the moon. Kennedy boasted that it would be done before the decade was over, and sure enough, in 1969, it was. Things like that that were done. They would be writing about as the things that changed America. And what is just astounding to us, to me anyway, I don't know if you think like this, but I lived through that. Amen. This, this isn't something that was back in Babylon or Egypt or Greece or something, or in the 1800s, or even in the 1930s, it's the 1960s, the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Now it's just anything goes today. But the 1960s, in one sense, I think we could say it was a privilege to be alive during the 1960s. So you saw firsthand what was taking place then. Mothers always gone to work today. And what starts that? You see a whole input. We'll study a lot about this whenever we study this in Christian ethics. But you see, with the pill, you can guarantee that you don't have children that you don't want to have, which then frees you up to go to work, which is going to cause tremendous problems in American society yeah. to have women in the workforce. Fathers are away on business trips all the time. Because of that, marriages split, break up. Children are raised in single-parent homes today. It's frightening how many children today in, let's just say, the public school system come from a single-parent home. It's frightening to see that. Now, that person, he, has, he or she has lost something in their upbringing that it's impossible to restore. Amen. You grow up with only a mother, only a father, and you see, what's going to happen down the road a few decades when all of these people who are children now are the people who are running things? You see, we, we have enough old codgers around, like President Reagan, who, you know, lived back in the good old days. Pretty soon, they'll all be dead. They'll be off the scene. We'll have nothing but people who were born in the 60s and raised in the 70s. Those will be the people. That's a frightening thing to think they're going to be in government in control of anything in the world today. They shouldn't even be allowed to control a convenience store on a corner somewhere. They're so unreliable. And you know how that goes. Oh, pace of life is picked up today. This colonization bit, people are becoming more and more isolated. You only have enough time. The pace of life is so quick, you really only have enough time for yourself, for you and for your own family. And so you just isolate yourself away from other people. Remember what this scripture says, that because of the increase in iniquity and wickedness, the love of many will wane, it will wax cold, it will grow cold, it won't be effective anymore. People won't love people anymore. People loving people, and I don't mean to sound like a humanist or a liberal, but should be, what's going, should be what exists in the world. It won't until the Prince of Peace comes, but it should. It doesn't even exist in the church of people loving people. Have you noticed how increasingly difficult it is to have friendships? Don't you remember some of you who lived in the 60s having friendships with other people? And you can't even be friends with people out there in the world today. It's difficult to even have relationships with people in the church, people that you know. Numerical gain is the bottom line in all businesses. Numerical gain. They want to find a percentage increase over last year. Now... Again, we're going to study this a lot in the future. That is such an erroneous way to think. Therefore, one's whole world view is based on increase. Increase at any cost with whatever means or methods. Increase is the bottom line. You're looking for a 5, an 8, a 10, or God bless us, a 20% increase over business last year. You're always looking for an increase, and everything is measured with that. That's the bottom line. That's the way businesses have to operate. They would never think of anything but that. In other words, the old-fashioned days are gone when I heard some talk about quality tonight where what anything doesn't have quality any, in it anymore today. 
it'd be good to own something that's old because you're probably guaranteed you're going to have something that has quality in it. It's a more and more hate-filled world that we're living in. Amen. We shared a few thoughts with you Sunday week ago. I wanted you to have enough time to think about those, and this is kind of a follow-up on that. And this is all preparation for some more things that we're going to do and to study in ethics. But it's a more and more hate-filled world. We're depersonalized because of our surroundings. People are scared and lonely in the world, and they don't even know it. I have a book at home. It has a picture. Well, just picture getting off an interstate on one of these roads that you get off an interstate, especially if it's in a town or in a suburb somewhere. And on both sides of the road, there'll probably be two filling stations and uh, two department stores and maybe a shoe store and then throw in three restaurants on both sides and just go all the way down the road, maybe for blocks and blocks and blocks. And all of those businesses have signs out in front of them, some flashing, big, small, bright colors, dull colors. They're all grabbing for attention of the passerby as he drives along, grabbing for attention. The picture has some caption under it. I don't remember exactly what it has, but this would be a good one. This is what I would write, and this was the, the intent, their purpose, loneliness. Now, you wouldn't think of loneliness with all the people and stores and the hustle and the bustle, but that's exactly what you have when you have something like that. As you drive along there, you are so depersonalized. Nothing, nothing no one caters to you as the customer anymore. All these flashing signs out there, you can find in your large cities, the loneliest place in the world to be is to be a bag lady amongst the millions in New York City. Now, you talk about loneliness amongst the millions of people that live in New York City, that live and work in New York City daily. The loneliest person there is the bum, the wino, the bag lady. Don't you remember you say, right away we can see that things have changed. Why, in the Old Testament, back in those days, you can find examples throughout the Old Testament like that case in the book of um, Judges with the man and his concubine where they're wandering around and they come into a city and the old man comes out of the field in the evening, sees him sitting out in the street and insists that they come home with him. And he said, I'll put you up. It's all at my expense. You don't find that anymore today. You say, well, I'd be afraid. To That's the whole point. People are scared because look at the thugs and the murderers out there. Wickedness, iniquity abounding. And there's a direct relationship. As it abounds, then you have a decrease in love, in warmth, in personableness. People don't even know how to be personable anymore. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I know I've taught you about this before, and then the Lord brings to my mind, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't get on to the people so much. Maybe some of you were even brought up in a home that was not a warm home, not a personable home. Maybe you don't even know what I'm talking about. You can hardly help it. You're just being raised in a society here where there's nothing but coldness around you all the time. Now, this is not true of some of you. You might have been raised in a home. I was raised in a, what you might call a touching home where there was hugging and kissing and crying. I, it never ceases to just shock me. And I read another account this week when I read someone's biography or autobiography or just some newspaper article. It talks about a man who doesn't touch his children. You know, there's no, there's verbal communication or a mother, but, but there's no touching. There's no hugging. There's no kissing. There's no playing. People don't even have time for that anymore today. You shuttle them off to a nursery somewhere. You hire someone in to watch them. Or you just buy a television set. It's an electronic babysitter for them. And I, I see, I was raised in a warm home where there was touching and kissing and you know you would kiss one another it was, there was nothing to be ashamed of there you kissed your father and your father kissed you in public people don't even do that anymore the old boy whenever his dad even wants to try to kiss him and lets him off at baseball practice he scuffs his shoes in the dirt and blushes and tries to sneak away real quickly before his dad can give him a big hug in front of anyone well why why does he do that 
his buddies will kid him whenever he can. You let your old man hug you and slobber on you over there. Well, used to, that's what everyone did. You were brought up in a warm environment like that. I was brought up in a warm environment. So many people, maybe some of you, and it's really a shame. I feel sorry for you. And you just have to be honest. Were you brought up in an environment like that? It's really, it's just a crying shame that some people have been brought up. And, and, and I guess those of us who were not in that situation somehow need to communicate to you what it's all about. I can't even imagine living in a non-touching home where there's not touch and pats and pettings and, and stroking of the hair and stroking of the cheek. You have to ask yourself, does that take place in your home? You see, I'm not being critical of any of you if it doesn't. I'm just trying to help you because some of you may never even think of that. It's just an automatic response of mine. And you may never even think of that. With parents and children, a warm and, and spouse to spouse, a warmth, a hugging and a, and a crying. And we just, we had that when we were growing up. And you just don't find that around you today. You look at people behind a cash register in a store they're lonely they're cold they're indifferent they're not responsive they're like a robot they don't even know it they don't even know what they're missing people don't cater to you at all anymore it's shocking if you ever get any personal treatment anywhere 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 today we don't even call them we don't our family service stations anymore because you don't get any they're gas stations or filling stations you get filled up with gas is all you get you have to ask them and what most of them now are self-serve there was no such thing as self-serve that was just part of the ethos of american culture to go into a filling station and and get filled up with gas and your oil checked and all of your windows wiped down and you could chat about the weather and the fishing and the trout stream over here. That was just a part of it. And now it's just in there and out. Pump the gas in and you're gone. See, we need to recognize these things. And we've got to make sure that we're not falling into this same trap ourselves. Sometimes you go into full. I've been into full service places. And have to honk your horn to get them to get out from behind the desk and come out there. And they think that they're doing you a service. To come out there like you owe them something, a tip. It's full service. You're already paying extra for the gas. Like they are gracing you with their presence to come out there and get their hands smelly with that filthy gasoline and its vapors on it. And I've had to ask, will you please clean the windshield, the front and the back? Sometimes you're tempted to say, I thought this just came with the package. I didn't know you had to ask to get your oil checked and for someone to kindly look over your whole car. Of course, you don't do that because then you're being just like they are, cold and cruel and mean. The last time I was in a full service place, I did get full service. I was in a hurry and I tried to pull out and he wanted to get all the windows. And whenever he did that, I just turned the car off. And I said, well, I said, you sure made my day. I was down in Manchester. I said, you sure made my day. Well, what do you mean by that? I said, you are so friendly. Well, he really liked that. He was the manager of the station. That's probably why he was friendly. <laughs> you hire these 17-year-old beatnecks out there, and it's just, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Get the, the buck in my pocket, and I'm gone from this place. This place doesn't mean anything to me. Now, those people have been raised that way by their parents. They picked up things from their parents of a lack of concern about other people, an indifferent attitude. That's why they act like that. You shouldn't be raising your children that way. So what? You're working there for minimum wage. It's a privilege to have a job. You're not doing someone else a service. They're doing you a service. It's a privilege to have a job. You have to drill that. And you see, if you don't watch out because our children are being brought up, and this is what we want to cover more in ethics, this whole business, your children being brought up in this wicked society, how are you going to curb that influence? It is so pervasive out there. They get in this wicked public school system, and all they hear is, is a worldly worldview, a humanistic worldview that goes totally contrary to what used to be referred to, and I guess it still is, but it's just referred to, it's not done anymore, as the old Protestant Puritan work ethic, where those values aren't counted as values, they're vices today. 
They're not values anymore. So I had a nice chat with this man. We, we stayed there for a few moments, and I was in a big hurry. I had an appointment to keep, but I said, this is just incredible that you actually you know, insisted that I stay here long enough so you could get that back windshield of mine. You know, when you have a car like our little car and the windshield slanted like that, it just is covered with filth all the time. And he said, no, a little car like this always has to have the back window clean. He said, that's very important. You can clean the front, you know, with your windshield wipers, but have got to clean the back for you. Made my day. You just don't find people like that anymore. You don't get any service when you go in stores. Those people are scared. They're lonely. They're in a rat race. They're there waiting for their, their time to finish, for the clock to, to, to tick off for them. They can punch out and be gone. They've got other things they've got to do. That didn't used to be the case. Used to, you had one store in town, and it was called the General Store. Mm -hmm. And the man there, well, half the time you didn't have to pay. He knew you'd pay next week or whenever you got some money. You just kept a running tab, a running bill there with him. He knew everyone in town. Amen. You could send little five-year-old Johnny down there, and he could bring everything. No one would mug him or steal his money at the store. Right. <laughs> or the clerk there wouldn't cheat him in returning change, you know. That used to be the way this good old country of ours was Amen. and it's changed drastically see it was more that way back several decades ago but i remember growing and living right through this myself we lived in in white haven a suburb south 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 memphis way on the south side we lived on a cove and there was only one street that separated the closed end of our cove from a field a big woods and then you had the mississippi state line right beyond that and i remember i have vivid memories this was suburbia, USA. Everyone with station wagons and mothers and PTA. It was suburbia, USA. All whites living around there, all middle class, all kept their yards very nice, except the Konemans across the street from us. But most everyone, except them, <laughs> kept their yards very nice and trim. And you know what mother and father did? They actually worked in their yard in the evening. You may be fine that people hire them to come in now, you know, or just let it run rampant or move into a condo, as they call it, so that someone else will do it for you. Well, it was a privilege to get home from work and get your work clothes off and go out and trim the bushes and mow the lawn, maybe shoot some hoop with your children if they were of that mind or of that gender, I might add. And I have vivid memories of, as a little boy, walking Oh, it was down the street, and then we lived on Pickett Cove, and you'd take a right on Pickett, and you'd walk down Pickett and take a left on Stacy, and down the hill, Stacy, and then it was a right, and I don't remember the name of that road, and then a left, and then a right, and then another left. It was always right, left, right, left, all the way there. Over to Shelby Drive. The county where Memphis is is Shelby County. They named the road after that, Shelby Drive. And I'd go there and get my hair cut in a little barber shop some old gentleman there and I probably paid a dollar or a dollar and a half maybe to get my hair trimmed there just a little boy I would walk the whole distance when I got big enough to ride a bike I'd ride my bike there my parents and I never thought a thing in the world about doing that walking that far away from home and carrying money you know in your own pocket and having to do business with you know adults you were just a boy five six seven years old and I have such vivid memories of of the times that I was in that barber shop. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, Kennedy had been killed in 63. Lyndon had been reelected in 64, and then he had all those problems, and he decided not to run again the next time presidential election. And I didn't know all the ins and outs of presidential elections, but I remember Lyndon Johnson because they had a big map up on the wall, these, um, these barbers. And before Johnson in the what was at the spring of the year, in March of the year, announced that he was not going to seek the presidency again. Before he announced that, there was a lot of speculation over who was going to win what state, you know, whenever the Democrats ran it off with the Republicans. And I remember Lyndon Johnson, they talked about Lyndon Johnson. They must have wanted to vote for him all the time. And I remember that. And across the street, we would go and for a penny buy two big, big pieces of bubble gum for a penny. And what not may be five, six, seven years after that time, well, we couldn't even go off of our street for fear of, I'll just be honest, and I, it's not just criticism of them, but it's a, a fact because of the blacks in the neighborhood that had moved in. We couldn't even go off the street for fear you were going to get knifed or shot or mugged, beaten up, something would happen to you. 
So my family just finally decided to pack up and we left for the hills and the lakes and the streams of Mississippi. No one's going to bother you down there. We just moved to a private lake. What else are you going to do? How can you raise your children in an environment like that? Anything that, that we had been taught as we were being raised was just evaporating in our lives because of the people that were our associates around us. We left our lawnmower just parked right out in the yard. No one was going to steal something like that. I don't remember of a single case, Now I may be wrong, but I don't remember of a single case of anything ever getting stolen from our yard, from our house. Now, we live here in rural Vermont. We should expect the same here. We put some reflectors up, stuck them in the ground, our drive so you could see to turn in. Well, they hadn't been up any time. They're gone. Some thief came along and stole those. Now that, and you see, you have to look at that as just wickedness because if you don't watch out, you just get so accustomed to that, well, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. That, those, that was on private property. Someone else had spent their money for that. You have no right to just go along and pick those things up and take them. They just took them. We've had gas caps stolen off of our car three times now. All you do is go to the store for $5 and buy your own. But we had to go do it. We bought cars with caps on them. We ought to be able to keep our caps. We paid for them. That was in the price of the car. Twice it happened back in Minnesota. It just happened here a couple of weeks ago. We have a car now that has, with the, with the little car, that has a, a door on it. You've got to open it and get in there and take the cap off and close the door back up. Stolen! We don't even know when or where it happened. You just open it up one day and it's gone. And you probably had a lot worse things than that happen. Those are some things that come to my mind. Of just things here in rural Vermont that you would expect things like that wouldn't take place. But... It's just happening everywhere, though. The government, we're saying this all the time, and it doesn't bother me in the sense that, well, I'm expecting us to have a Christian government, so I'm shocked when I see otherwise, but we should still be shocked because they are representatives of the people. Uh, they should be concerned for the people, and all they are is a bunch of crooks, rich, crooks and liars. It's coming out all the time. Businesses are the same way. They don't care about customers anymore. <laughs> they care only about the dollar. They care only about your money. They give you a hard time if you ever want to exchange anything. You have to go through a hassle of, do you have your slip with you? You've got to return that, and what day was it on? And we've got only a seven-day period of grace, and after that, no returns. Why? They can't keep up with all the confusion. People thought it was going to be such a good thing where we have industrialization and commercialization and urbanization and it's turned out to be a blight and a curse instead of a blessing. Think how many thousands of people go into a store somewhere. They can't possibly return everything that everyone or allow them to return everything every store wants to return. Used to, we just had a small store here or there. And it didn't seem like back in those days that people needed as much as they need today. <laughs> Why do we have to have so much? I think that it used to be a privilege when... Now, this is really dating you. This is back to the 1800s. Whenever you got to at the end of the year after your harvest had come in and your family had made a profit to order a pair of shoes out of the mail order catalog. Now, that used to be a privilege. I really wish I could live in days like that. You are taught just by scarcity and by poverty. You're taught the worth of a dollar. You're taught the value of everything around you. People like that have a, had a different value system than we have today. Amen. Now everything is just disposable. Just disposable. Even pastors are disposable. Everything is just disposable. They're talking about, now we have a new disposable camera. You've seen that? Six ninety five. buy a camera, take it to the beach. If it gets sand in it, so what? You send it off the whole camera, and they'll develop your film. They're talking about disposable cars now. Well, they've been having those for a long time. I'll just add that for free. They've had disposable cars for a long time. Products are built with a built-in period of deterioration. They're constructed that way. Why? Because people are liars and deceivers today. This goes right back into Christian ethics, how important truthfulness is. They're liars and deceivers. They're crooks out there in the world today. 
They're so wicked. They're so backwards. People in the olden days would take pride in building something that would last for a lifetime. They didn't then think so selfishly, well, if I build this to last for a lifetime, I'll never have this person as a customer again to buy this object. They never even thought like that. They just took pride in the work that they did. And today, no one, no one in the world would think a thought like that. They're going to build something that has deterioration built into it. It's got a certain number of years or months or weeks or days that it will last. And we thought plastic would be the best thing in the world, and everything's just breakable plastic. It really is breakable. Just all tears and destroys. They thought, now, this would be indestructible, this new ingredient that we've come up with, this man-made substitute, plastic. And it is a substitute for the real thing. And you see this, Matthew 24, 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. That's happening right in our world today around us. We have had problems and struggles and teachings here in our own church about that, trying to get across to you what the Bible teaches about love and how to have relationships with other people. But we live, and you live, in such a hate-filled environment. It's affecting you. It's depersonalizing you. It's slowly stripping you of your sensitivity. You don't even know it. You see, when it's happening to people out there in the world, they don't even know it. That's how parasites operate, though. You don't even know that the poison is there, that the leaven is spreading. And if someone does know, they say, well, there's nothing we can do about it, is there? It's just the way the big, bad, wicked world is. Well, people don't even know what friendship is even anymore today. They don't know anything about love or kindness or sharing or sacrifice. And it's one of the signs of the last days, according to Matthew 24. The formula there in that verse is abounding iniquity will equal decreasing sensitivity. And that's certainly what we're seeing today. Abounding iniquity equals decreasing sensitivity or love. And you see, if you've got sin around, love can't exist in sin. Most forms of sin are selfishness, and love is selflessness. So in that sense, we could consider love and sin being opposites. Where you've got the increase of sin, you simply cannot have love. Now you just think with me for a moment how enjoyable life would be if you had neighbors that would actually come over and chat with you. Of what you don't even know your neighbors anymore. That you would have neighbors that would come and chat. That whenever you moved into a new home, your neighbors for that first week would make sure you're supplied with food and soup and drink and whatever you need until you got settled. That used to be the way that it is. Amen. You don't even have that anymore. You move in, they don't even they don't know you, they don't want to know you. They're too busy with their own life. That is a sign of the times. We had neighbors move in. We took them some food over. And you don't hear anything from them as a result of that. We find out that they're Christians. Oh, this was a few years ago, a year or so ago. Pentecostals. And so, you know, we, we're Pentecostal. We're Christians. We're charismatic. We still never hear from them. They've been over to our house maybe, maybe twice, maybe only once. And that was just recently for the man to have some people over our house getting our car started to help him get his car started. That's the first time I remember in over a year he's even set foot on our property to come and get his car started one morning when it was too cold. Now, they're fellow believers. They're not gone all the time. I see their car parked out there. They don't come over. People live in their own little insulated environment. They have their own life, their own family. This couple doesn't even have any children. I mean, they don't have things that are occupying their time all, all the time. They just want to be there alone. They don't want to talk to anyone else. And that's what I'm saying. It's a sign of the last days. When I was growing up, back in the semi-good old days, we knew every single person on our street. 
Now, we lived on a cove, so it's easier to get to know one another on a cove, but there had to have been 15 or more families. We knew every single family. You'd see people out when they'd get home from work. The men would be out, you know, in the driveway with their ties and suits still on, chatting with the neighbor across the street. He just got home from work. They'd be out there chatting together. Now you have to see movies to see that or ask your parents to tell you about it or look at pictures or postcards to even see that anymore. Neighbors actually acting as though they're neighbors. People don't know how to be friendly anymore. They're being cauterized, as I've said before. They're dulled toward this. They're cold. They're insensitive anymore. They don't recognize needs around them. They don't want to see any needs around them because they might have to help, and they wouldn't want to do that because that might involve sacrifice in their own life. We've got a country store not far from us, and we visit there every now and then to pick up something, but what country stores are just like supermarkets so many times? Now, I know there are exceptions. Praise God for the exceptions, but I don't find very many of them. We go in here, and it's just no talk at all. They don't say anything to you, not hello, good morning, nice day. It's just they stand there and look at you, and you pick up what you want, and you have some money, and you just look at one another. You hand the money, they change it, hand back to you. That's all that's done. Nothing said. That's the extent of the transaction. Why can't people recognize something is dreadfully wrong with our society when you have people like that who act like robots behind a cash register? They just punch the buttons. They just want their paycheck, and they want to get out of there. Their real life is not connected to their work. Their real life is connected to some other hobby they have that they want to go and do that evening. It's not really connected to their work. And that's why they give us such shoddy work then. A few months ago, it was again down in Manchester. We had gone to get some gas somewhere down there, and, and a, a black man came out to fill the tank up. And you don't see very many blacks around here in Vermont. Less than 1%, I understand, of the population of Vermont. Less than 1%, just a fraction of a percent of Negroes around here. And I don't remember exactly what got the conversation going, but I think I just piped up because I know how to act around black people, especially if he's from the South. Now, if he's from the North, we'll forget him. They're just like whiteies, you know. They're not like real black people. So, so, I, took, so I took a chance. I took a chance, and I just came right out, and I said, you know, you don't see many... And you don't call them Negroes. They don't like to be called Negroes. They're black men. You don't see many black men up north. And then he started talking. And as soon as he was talking, I could tell you came from the same state I did. And I said, you're from the south, aren't you? And he said, that's exactly right. And he named the little town in Mississippi. And I said, oh, that's not far from where I live. Oh, just slap the car, you know. By George, you know. And there we just took off for a nice, friendly conversation. And it took a black man to even have a friendly conversation. We could identify with the deep south and, and vittles and good food down there and the warmth of southern hospitality, you know. And, and we just really began to talk then. He wasn't offended by me calling him a black man at all. He just lit up whenever he knew I was from the South and that, and that I was raised with a black maid. And, oh, that was just great. You know, black people are good people. And there's just not enough of us good people up here in the North. You know, less than 1% in this state. I don't know what brought him up here. I think business did long ago. And, and um, he enjoyed it enough to stay. Now, that's a rare experience for me in Vermont, to have someone that will actually Paul, slap the car and laugh and talk and you're back to a warm, touching relationship. You pat each other on the back, you know, all of this business. Most people, it's, you know, don't touch me. I'm afraid of you. You're going to mug me or rape me or rob me or something, you know. Don't touch me. They just want the transaction to take place and then it's out of sight, out of mind. They want you to be gone or them gone, one or the other. And that comes right over in because you're living in that world out there, right over into your own life right over into your own relationships. And I am convinced some of you have been raised in that type of environment so long and to such a degree, that's why you don't know what love is all about. That's why you don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. When I say, why don't you talk to me or our family more often? Why is it we rarely ever hear from you? That didn't used to be in the olden days. The people knew their pastor. They talked to him. 
Today, with big time religion, you know how it's even presented. You've got that big minister up there, and he's got a thousand people out there. He can't talk to them. So he's brought in with a security guard and out with a security guard and out the back entrance and right on into his hotel room. You see, you see that happen all the time, and so that's just the mentality that you pick up. Right away, that's just exactly what people start thinking. There's something dreadfully wrong with that. People here in the church sometimes can't even have good relationships anymore. And you think back early in your life, you probably had better relationships with pagan people before you even saved. It's because that was before we have got such a change in the times and the ethos of American life and living today. Times are different. And the difference, I'm, I'm sad to say, is worse. We haven't improved. You could have a change for the better, but we change not for the better. And it's not going to get any better. It's going to grow worse and worse. Jesus said that iniquity is going to abound. It's going to grow and increase and blossom. And as that increases in direct proportion to that, people's ability to know what love is and to have a relationship and to be what I call a personable person, warm, they don't even know the right thing to say. They're stiff. They're cold. They don't even know the right thing to say. I know some people, they can't even get a conversation going. They don't know what to say. They really don't. I feel sorry for them. For the continuation of this message, please turn the...